we need to make sure that the dollars that we are uh, needing for public education, especially, especially of the youth, the little bit of research that I've looked at, that's kind of the big thing that comes out. By the time you get to age 21 or 18 or something, most of your brain development, actually they say 25, I think, it's into the mid-20s. You can still be making your brain be not as full potential if you're smoking pot into your like early 20s. So your brain is still developing. But once you're 25 and older, as, as far as, the, again, the little bit of research that I've done on this, um, you can smoke all the pipe on. It's not going to hurt much more. Not, you're not hurting yourself much more physically than you are drinking or doing some other stupid activities, right? So pick your battles and, and do, your, do your things. But from a, from a development, from a public safety standpoint, uh, if we allow alcohol, a lot of people argue that uh, having the people chilled out on alcohol is a little better than, or chilled out on, on pot is a little bit better than having them whacked out on, on alcohol and, and other drugs. So. All right, any other questions or comments there? Yeah? What is the effect of that? What is, uh, so the question was, what is the effect of legalizing it on businesses? Um, so what, if, if, uh, if pot, and I'm not sure exactly where you're going, that's kind of a wide open question, but if pot and alcohol are substitutes with each other, do the liquor stores like this change? No, right? So it might be taking away, there might be some substitution away from other lawful activities. Um, there might be uh, benefits to, to companies that have complementary goods to pot, like Doritos. <laughs> so Cheeto and Dorito sales might go up. So the snack food, the snack food and pizza places might like this new legalization, right? So those are the types of things you need to think about when you legalize it. Yes, there might be still some people that get hurt and some people that get help. All right, any other comments or questions there? All right. Um, so let's go through our sheets. I asked you to today to bring a, to bring a sheet. And if you don't have your sheet, then you need to copy down this graph. That's like the second page of the so on your notebook papers, all this is is home base. All this is is home base, but then I've got all these letters in here. So copy that down if you don't have if you don't have the sheet. And so we've uh, I'm going to blow this up a little bit right now. Okay, so make sure you get these things. So if you start with home base, ABC represents consumer surplus in a free market, right? And then FGJ represents producer surplus. So that's just like what we were doing in chapter five from last week. Hopefully that'll start to pop out at you. And you might have had some uh, problems that we did from chapter five stuff that had you identify the consumer and producer surplus areas. So let's just say that at $4, just to get some numbers in, um, the quantity in a free market was a thousand units. And of course the equilibrium price in a free market was four dollars. And so the free market is our is our baseline that we're going to compare to a number of different uh, policy arrangements. So with a free market, we have consumer surplus equal to area A plus B plus C and producer surplus equal to area F plus G 
plus j. Just like what we did, we're just doing it a little bit differently than what I presented in class before, the triangular areas. Any questions on that, for starters? So that is our home. All right. So down below, I have a bunch of different policy changes of the government of government intervention. So we're going to go through each one individually. The first one's a tax. Next one's a subsidy. Price ceiling, a price floor without government expenditure, I'll explain this later, a price floor with government expenditure, and then finally the target price program. Yes? Did you show the top? Yeah, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get it back up there in a sec. Uh, you can do this one a little bit differently on your notes. You can just keep track of it as we do, so don't feel like you have to replicate that. You can, you can handle this one a little bit differently. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is a tax of $2.00 and compare that to the free market. So if I implement a tax of $2 in here, I get this tax wedge, remember, right? So I kind of float in my uh, tax wedge. Except this wedge isn't big enough. Maybe my cap will be about right. Right? And I wedge it in there. Or you can think about it like we did last time by shifting the supply curve up by $2. But I like to do the tax wedge just because I like floating that thing in and singing my little song as I get in there. So once the tax wedge gets in there, that tax wedge is this vertical height. The top part touches the demand curve, telling you the price the consumer pays. Now, I gave you a formula yesterday on determining what the relationship between the tax, the price the producer pays, or the price the producer receives and the price the consumer pays. So what is the producer getting after the tax? What is PP under this <coughs> circumstance? We've got a tax of $2, and our original circumstance was the equilibrium price in a free market was 4 and 1000 how much is the producer getting after the tax? Yes? $3. Good, right? So $5, the price that the consumer pays, minus the $2 tax is the bottom part of the tax wedge, touches the supply curve, telling you the price the producer receives, PP. So PP is $3. <laughs> All right, so now on your thing down on the bottom, I'm going to make this a little smaller so you can get it all on there now. I'm asking you for the changes in consumer and producer surplus relative to the free market. What happened to the consumers? What is the change in consumer surplus? What is the change in consumer surplus? Decrease is good. Buy. Now we got to talk talk letters in this case. A is the change. A is the new. A is the new. So what's the change? B and C, positive or minus. Minus B minus C, right? So we used to have ABC, but now we've got just A. So the new consumer surplus just area A. And so down here in the box, to keep track of that, we're going to say minus B minus C. In other words, the consumer lost B and C. What about the producer? We used to have F, G, and J. Now we only have J minus F and G. Yeah, see, it's the other J. Minus F minus G, right? So again, if we look at the graph, this is real important for you to get right now. The old producer surplus is this area after the tax. 
we're only going to get this area. The thing that I forgot to note down here that I probably should have done already was that QT, the quantity after the tax, is something less than what we had before. So let's just say that was uh, $500, or 500 units rather. So with the tax, we get down to 500 units, QT. All right, now we have a new player in here, the government. What is the change in government revenue compared to the free market? With the free market, how much was the government collecting? Zero. Zero. With the tax? Plus B plus F, right? So that's our tax wedge area. That's the one we were doing with pot right here. The height of the wedge, so we get plus B plus F. Plus B plus F. Uh, uh, change in government revenue. So the amount of money that the government's collecting. The government revenue went up by B and F. So Wednesday when we went over that, that was the tax revenue. Uh, on this graph we just did on pot, it's this is area. Okay? Any other questions? All right, now the fun part. How did society change, right? So society is composed of, and if we go back to our our picture here, just to kind of make you step back from the from the trees and look at the forest. Yeah, if we look at the market system here, our island that we live on can be thought of as composed of consumers, households, producers, and the government. Those are the only three parties that we're analyzing, but that's everybody, right? We're categorizing everybody into those three components. And so by doing that, we've got society represented here. And if we add them up, we got minus B, oops, the consumers lost B, but oh, good news, the government gained it. Minus F, plus F, total them all up, minus C, minus G. And what did we call C and G? Dead weight loss. So that's our dead weight loss down here. So the total change to society is our dead weight loss. If it's negative. If negative. If it's positive, then it's a gain. <laughs> okay, so questions on the tax. This is a good way to review all those ones we did, and now we're applying our welfare analysis stuff from Chapter 5. Um, Subsidy. So instead of, and now we're not adding on to the tax situation. We're not adding on. We're just going to compare the subsidy to the free market, right? So go back to the free market and look at what a subsidy of $2 does. So with the subsidy, where does the tax wedge start in on? The left or the right? From the right. So we start to float our boat coming in from the right because it's like a negative tax. Do, 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 right here, and it gets wedged in. That two dollar height is the is the amount, and so the subsidy. That's not showing up very well, but that's actually a green marker. Is here. The top part of the subsidy wedge touches the supply curve, and tells you the price that who is. Who's, who's that one associated with? The producer on this, because we're going to the supply curve, so always kind of use that as your crush. Since the top part of the wedge touches that, this is now PP for the subsidy case, and the bottom part of the wedge touches the demand curve, which means that, that students are going to be paying tuition of $3. They are PC with case number two. All right, so <coughs> subsidy. What is the change in consumer surplus? The change in consumer surplus for the $2 subsidy. Again, going back to the free market, the consumers had A plus B plus C. 
And now, what is the change in consumer surplus? Minus A plus F plus G. Minus, hold on, minus A plus F plus, plus G, G H. H and I? Not the I, no. Not the I. Or oh, the H. Not too far. Just the F and the G. H sounded good. Okay, now I again forgot to look at the subsidy quantity. What is the quantity after the subsidy? Do subsidies tend to encourage or discourage consumption? Encourage. encourage. So we were talking about like education being here before. And so after the subsidy, the quantity after the subsidy is right here. So QS equals, let's say, 1,500 units. Just making up some numbers there to motivate things. So did anybody have, you, you wanted to get rid of A. Consumer surplus is the difference between what a consumer is willing to pay and what they actually pay for each unit consumed. So which ones do you want to do? What do you, what do you want to add on? Give me, talk to me in areas. What is the change in consumer surplus? We used to have A, B, and C. F, G, H, and I. So we did want to take an I. Now, now, watch me through this thought exercise of the definition and why I want you to have the definition memorized. Watch this. So starting from left to right, the very first consumer was willing to pay this amount. They actually paid $3 with the subsidy. Willing, actual, willing, actual, willing, actual, willing, actual, willing, actual, willing, actual, all the way out to the number of units that they actually consume, which is 1,500. And so you are absolutely right. This little trapezoid here is what we added on. So we get plus F plus G plus H plus I. Good. What about the producers? <laughs> They used to have F, G, and J. B, C, and D. B, C, and D. So again, the producers are selling 1,500. Producer surplus is defined as the difference between what the producer actually gets, which in this case is $5, and the minimum amount they must get, which is the height of the supply curve. Actual, minimum, actual, minimum, actual, minimum, actual, minimum, actual, minimum, actual, minimum, all the way up to 1,500 units. So they have gained plus B, plus C, plus D. Ooh, this looks like a good policy. Maybe we should have the government giving away money. What is the change in government revenue? Minus... Hold on, let me get my stick out here. I better use. I found out that I was leaving marks. If you see little black marks on the screen, that was for me. Other time, so oh, I will use the metal part. I was using this end, and it was leaving little marks on board. All right, B, C, D, E. I in the box. What else? Is that it? F, G, H, and I. Good, that's right. I like to do that little voice intonation so you guys think, oh, what, that must be wrong. Okay, so how do we get that? Let's just think through the logic here. How many units are being sold? 1,500. For every unit, the government's paying how much? $2, which is the height of the wedge. So base times height is the area of this rectangle. Sometimes in a homework problem, you're asked to calculate that. If you were asked to calculate it here using the numbers that I've got, how much money is the government spending on this program? Two times 1,500 is 3,000 bucks, right? So that area represents 3,000 bucks, but the way we're doing it in this exercise, it is government spending. So like you said, it's a negative. <laughs> Negative B, negative C, negative D, negative E, negative F, negative G, negative H, negative I. Add them all up. How did the government, how did this policy work out? Let's see, we got a plus F, minus F, plus G, minus G, plus H, minus H, plus I, minus I, plus B, plus, minus B, plus C, minus C, plus D, minus D. Add them all up. Negative E. Dead weight loss. 
And notice that it ends up being that little triangular region, which is awfully close to the triangular region we saw with the tax. It's kind of similar. I remember one of you, was that you? Somebody asked about the dead weight loss. Yeah. Yeah. So now you, that's it. That's why I wanted to hold off on it because it's a little, it's a little harder to see. And that's why we use this technique to identify what the dead weight loss, because we have lots of overlapping areas with this particular policy. Okay. Questions on the subsidy? Price ceiling. Price ceiling. The government comes out and says prices cannot be higher than three dollars. At three dollars. So if that's our ceiling price, I got a big fat marker there. That doesn't look very good. Price ceiling. Prices cannot go above three dollars. The intent of the policy is to help who? Producers or consumers? The intent of the policy. Consumers. We want to protect consumers. We think, oh, corn prices are way too high at $4. Let's just say the max it can be is $3, right? Change in consumer plus. Change in consumer surplus with the price ceiling. Plus FGHI. Plus FGHI. Sound good? No. I see some head shake and support, but then I see some others saying no. All what? Now remember, we're comparing it to the free market, which is ABC for the consumer, right? So compared to ABC, one thing that might be helpful is with the price ceiling, how many units are the consumers consuming? Using the numbers that I've got up here. 500. Consumer surplus is the difference between what a consumer is willing to pay and what they actually pay for each unit they consume. Willing, actual, willing, actual, willing, actual, willing, actual, that's it. They would love to buy 1,500, but they're getting screwed because they're all gone. Right? We have a shortage with them. And so the price or the quantity with the ceiling price ends up being here. What is now the change in consumer surplus from the price ceiling? A, B, and F? That's the new consumer surplus. So what's the change in consumer surplus compared to the free market? Minus C, we lost C but we gained F, right? The old triangle was ABCD. The new thing is this trapezoid, ABF. So we lost C, but we gained F. So <coughs> minus C plus F. Producers, minus F and G, right? They used to have this, now it's this. So now all they have is J, which means we lost F and G. Minus F, minus G. Now I want to point out something real briefly here is that a lot of times you're like, oh, well, we're going to take it from those big bad sellers, those landlords, and give it to the consumers, right? And that's kind of what's going on here with F. Look at these guys lost F, these guys gained F. So that, that's partially true that there is a, a transfer from producers to consumers from that policy. Remember my Robin Hood theory of taxation, take from the rich, give to the poor, take from the employed, give to the unemployed, take from the young, give to the old, that's you guys with social security, all the money that you're making, but I, it's going to go to old parts. So that, that's not put in some fund. It's a transfer program. The government takes it from you and gives it to retirees, right? Take from the young, give to the old. Those are all transfer programs that the government goes on. That is possible here. The thing that people misconstrue because they don't understand their economics is it's not dollar for dollar. If I take a dollar from this group, this group's not getting that full dollar. And that's part of what we're capturing here with this analysis. All right, government revenue, price ceiling, change in government revenue? No, nothing, right? It's just a law. 
So it's kind of like our pot over here. They just said, sorry, new law can't be higher than $3. So no government revenue. So that's a big Zippo. Add them all up, plus F minus F, minus C minus G, dead weight loss. Price floor. So on this one, we're going to have the government say, oh man, we got to protect those farmers. Here's the price floor, right? So a price floor, the intentions of the policy is to protect consumers or producers? Producers in this case, okay? So when we implement the price floor, what is the quantity that's going to be exchanged in the market? We're trying to help producers, 1,500? Nobody wants to buy them at that, right? So yes, the farmers are gonna plant crops so that we get 1,500 bushels, but at a price of $5, consumers are gonna say, I'll buy pork, I don't need your corn. I'll, I'll buy some beans or something. I'll buy something else. $5 is way too expensive. And so it creates a surplus of corn, right? So the quantity after the price floor ends up being here again, which means the change in consumer surplus is what? Change in consumer surplus. Used to be ABC minus B minus C. They lost B and C because now they're paying $5 for the corn. Producers. They used to have FGJ and now what do they have? Minus the G plus B, right? So the consumer or the producers are selling 500 bushels so they gained area B but they lost area G. So plus B minus G, government revenue, Zippo, plus B minus B, add them all up, minus C minus G, dead weight loss. All right, so this turns out to be actually a true story um, in, in our US history, that the government implemented a price floor for farmers and that was the result, what we just saw. There's a surplus and a bunch of farmers holding the corn. And Congress goes, oh crap, we were trying to help you, man. Sorry, my bad. Didn't really think through all the uh, ins and outs of this whole deal. So um, got to make it up to you somehow because we were trying to help you, not hurt you. Um, how about if we just buy your corn? We'll buy the extra corn. That's exactly what the government did. So that's what this next column is is the price floor with government expenditure, government buying up the surplus, okay? Government's gonna buy up the surplus of corn to help the farmers. We're gonna compare it to a free market again. So again, we're not building on this one. We're starting fresh, free market, price floor, government buys the surplus. Change in consumer surplus. So this created a little surplus here, right? Yeah. Now the government's gonna buy that. So the $5 is still on the table. What's those consumers, what's the change in consumer surplus relative to free market? Minus B minus C, it didn't change, that's right. So minus B minus C, the, the consumers are still buying 500 at a price of $5. So in that respect, the consumers are indifferent between these two policies. So when Congress comes along and says, oh, we're just gonna buy up the surplus, the consumers are like, ah, I don't care. You're screwing me either way, screwed here, screwed here, but I'm not more screwed here than I was here, so I don't care, right? I'm indifferent between those two policies. Change in producer surplus. Compared to free market, FGJ, DC and B, right? So they're selling, the, the farmer doesn't really care if they sell it to the government or they sell it to the person. 
So they're going to end up selling 1,500 units at a price of $5. And so their producer surplus grew by B, C, and D, plus B, plus C, plus D. Change in government revenue. All right, hold on. Minus what? D as in dog. Okay, so D, C, and G? Is that what you said? B. D, C, and B. So let's let's kind of let's kind of get away from from this for a second and think through um, money. Kind of ignore the graph for a second. How much money is the government spending on the program, given the numbers that I've cooked up here? No, no letters. I want real money. And we can, you can do the equation if you want. How many dollars? Are they spending? How many units are they buying? A thousand, right? So we've got 500 being bought by the consumers, but there's a thousand being purchased. How much are they paying for? Five dollars. Five times a thousand is five thousand dollars. Now back to our area, area of a rectangle. Five times a thousand is a base times a height deal. What is our amount in terms of letters? C, D, E, I, H, G, L, and M, all the way down here, right? That whole thing. So let's do it. Let's do it. We got uh, minus C, minus D, minus E, minus G, minus H, minus I, minus L. Minus M. Now the fun part. How did society end up with this new Congress law here? We got plus B, minus B, got that, minus C, plus C, plus D, minus D. Woo, that would be. Minus C, minus E, minus G, minus H, minus I, minus L, minus M. <laughs> okay, so that, and again, remember, there's, uh, this is paralleling a real world story. This is what went on in our government here. Now, uh, with you guys, with your economic toolbox just starting to be built up, which policy is better for society? Which, one, which one's more harmful for society with government expenditure? Now, how do you know that for sure? Not just, oh, there's a whole bunch of negatives here, Russ. I want a little more meat on the bones. Okay, I'll come, let me come back to you on that. How, how would you know for sure that this policy is worse than this policy? There's more, but there's something specific here I want to point out. Mm, look at the letters. How do you know for sure that this is bigger? C and G is in both, right? C and G, C and G. So there's no doubt that this one creates more deadweight loss, right? Even if we don't have perfect numbers to actually calculate it, using this letter theory, we're able to uh, deduce that this is worse than this. All right, um, let, me, let me come back to you, dumping it off to other countries. Um, the uh, commodities markets are actually global already. So by, by dumping it off to a foreign country, you're going to disrupt the market system already. And, and you'll be breaking your own law. Of course, the government tends to do this once in a while anyway. They created the law that they can sell it at a lower price, but not, not anybody else. So that's the problems with the dumping it off to another country or, or giving it away. And even if they give it away, they're disrupting the markets, right? Because it's corn that would have been purchased anyway. So after they worked through those details, guess what happened to this corn that they inventoried that they bought from, from the farmers? Real world, back to real world again. Guess what happened to the corn? They sold it at a higher price. Wrong. There wasn't a higher price. It turned out $5 was way too high to begin with. 
They got rid of the corn kind of in a unique way. Congress decided, well, hold on to it, and we'll talk about it next month. <laughs> hold on to it, we'll talk about it next month. Hold on to it, we'll talk about it next month. So you've got all this corn inventoried in bins, and it all rotted. It rotted away. You talk about a classic case of dead weight loss. This was really at the top high end of it. That corn just was wasted away. They couldn't give it away because it would disrupt markets and they'd be breaking their own laws. There was no way out of this. So this is the, one of the most uh, uh, classic cases of dead weight loss in such a powerful way to see food, yet there's people hungry out on the streets, to see food being wasted away. But that's exactly what happened in the United States. So an economist got a hold of this, finally, after Congress piddle paddled it around trying to help the world, and came up with another idea called the Target Price Program. And again, this is real world. The Target Price Program looks, uh, works like this. The government sets a target price. That target price is going to be $5 so that all the farmers know that they're going to get $5. Very similar to the previous program, right? But they're going to call it a target price. Producers are going to produce what they wish, and then people are going to buy up all of the corn at the highest price they're willing to pay, right? And then the government's going to make up the difference with a deficiency payment. The deficiency payment. Let's take a look at that. Let me walk it through with the numbers here. So the target price program, the government sets a target price. It's going to be $5. So PT now is the target price. Using our numbers, how many units are the producers going to make, knowing that they're going to get $5? 1500 We're right back to where we were. So the quantity with the target price program, I want to call this target, not T, so we don't confuse it with tax. The quantity with the target price program, and actually let me call this QM for market. And you can, we can put MK, MKT for market quantity. Now we're going to sell all of that to consumers. What are they willing to pay for 1,500 units of corn? <coughs> Not five. Three. 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 The demand curve tells us, law of demand says, shows all of the prices people are willing to and able to pay at various prices. So if you dump 1,500 units on the market, you go up to the demand curve, hang the left, and that tells you the price that they're willing to pay. So we're going to call that the market price PM. So the market price is PM. The government's going to make up the difference. How much is the government going to pay each and every farmer that produced the 1,500 units? Two bucks. That is this amount here is called the deficiency payment. So this is called the deficiency payment of the target price program, which equals $2. And that's it. We're done. That's how the target price program works. What is the change in consumer surplus under the target price program? Compared to a free market, we're going back to free market. So ABC is what we start off with. Now we have a target price program. What's the change in consumer surplus? FGHI, no. We had ABC. And I'm sorry, I said no, but you're right. <laughs> I don't want to screw you up anymore that my brain was flipped around. So the consumers are paying $3, right? And they're buying 1,500 units. So you're absolutely right, Kylie. FGHI. We're adding on that amount. So plus F plus G plus H plus I. Producer surplus is where my brain was kind of jumping to already. Compared to a free market, what do the producers get out of this? They're selling 1,500 units at a price of $5. They used to have F, G, and J, but now with the target price program, what do they have? 
B, C, and D, right? They added on B, C, D. So B, C, D plus B plus C plus D. And then what's the government shelling out for this program? B, H, I, what else? How much to dollars? Let's go back to dollars. They're paying a deficiency payment of $2 to every farmer that produced corn. How much are they spending on this program? Dollars. 3,000, 1,500, 1,500 units times the deficiency payment of $2, which gives us this whole rectangle, which is minus B, minus C, minus D, minus E, minus F, minus G, minus H, minus I. I think I got them all. And now the fun part, we add them up. How did society fare on this one? Let's see, we got a plus B and a minus B, we got a plus C and a minus C, we got a plus D and a minus D, we got a plus I and a minus I, we got a plus F and a minus F, we got a plus G and a minus G, we got a plus H and a minus H, and minus E. -E. Now, let's go back to Congress and testify to Congress on this. Which policy is better, the target price or the price floor with government expenditure? Target price or the price floor with government expenditure? Target price, target price right? Check this out, like we did last time, E and E. We eliminated a lot of waste, right? So we're definitely better off in terms of dead weight loss. Now, the intent of the policy was to help the farmer. Did we hurt the farmer a little bit by changing the policy? Did we hurt the farmer a little bit by changing from this policy to this policy? Did the farmer get hurt a little bit? I hear some people say no, no, why? Why do you know with certainty? This is what's happening from our gut feelings from some of those other disciplines and all the politicians like, oh, I think we should help them. Right? We actually quantify this stuff. How do you know that? How can you stand strong and say, no, I know the farmers didn't get hurt any more than they would have here. It's not the minus E, it's the what? BCD. Right? This policy got them BCD. This policy gives them BCD. Do they care which one they do? No. Not personally, they don't care. If they're out for their own self-interest, they don't care. That's our assumption is that people are seeking their own self-interest. How about consumers? Did we hurt them, this policy versus this policy? Did we hurt the poor consumer? No, no, right? In fact, these guys gain, they like this policy a lot more compared to, to this one, right? So by looking, by using this supply and demand and welfare analysis, we're able to conclusively that this government policy is much better than this government policy across the board, right? This one is far superior to this one. And that's something you will not hear Trump and Hillary do at all during this next month of debates. They won't have the time in their defense. I don't think I should be defending either one of those two. But they won't really have the time to do this type of analysis. But this is the type of thing that hopefully they relied on some economists to justify what they were doing and they did something like that. If you start to dig into the details, you can find out if they did this type of an analysis on the policies that they're proposing. Okay, any questions? There is a good question I'm waiting for a student to ask for. I've been doing this for 20 years. I'll just tell you there's a great question looming that is worth an extra credit point. If somebody can tell me what it is. Look at this whole thing now that we've summarized everything. There's a great question loom at us. What do you got? Okay, that's a good question, not an extra credit question, but, but that's a good question. Not, not the one I was looking for, Colin, right? Um, so yeah, th this is kind of striking. They all have create dead weight loss. And, and part of that's going to come down to what, what's missing out of this. This is kind of a, what, what you call a piecemeal type of thing. 
because we're not learning what the government's doing with the money. That was brought up before. Remember somebody said, what's the government doing with the money? Well, we don't really have that model here, right? Are they, are they building roads and bridges or are they increasing politicians' spending accounts so that they can go out to dinner more frequently? You know, what, what are they doing with the money? We don't have that modeled here at all. So that's where that thing would start to come about. But what we can conclude is that they are all creating deadweight loss. So if the free market did not have other issues with it, um, this is going to be coming out of somebody's pocket, both, part, and both the consumers and the producers' pocket. The part where I'm emphasizing we don't know what's happening is uh, if, it, if we're talking about government revenue being collected, then what are they doing with that money? Maybe that has other benefits to consumers and producers. You see what I mean? So that, that part of it is, is, is missing. Hello, I saw your hand first. Why don't they just think it's up? Okay, Kylo got it. All right, that, that's the one that is the one that's just kind of staring you in the face here. Subsidy target price. See any differences? No. There is a difference. But we need to think dynamically. We need to think long term. Like, how does this thing evolve? What's going to happen over the next? What's going to happen over the next 10 years with this policy? Sometimes when Congress passes laws, they tend to be sticky, right? They're kind of hard to undo what was done when they, when they pass a law. And so if this tends to be sticky, tell me about next year and the, and the year after and the year after. If it's the subsidy, does the subsidy ever disappear without an act of Congress? Once the law is passed, it's going to be $2 per unit. Does it ever disappear? It's just the same, right? There would have to be a new law to make it go away. Now, suppose that we figure out how to run cars on corn. That would be weird, wouldn't it? Suppose that we learn a new technology and the demand curve shifts to my pen. If, if the demand curve shifts over time, what happens to the amount of dollars Congress is spending under the subsidy plan? It goes up. We know for sure because it's the $2 subsidy stayed fixed, but the quantity went up. With the subsidy, if we do it our little do 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 it would float in over here somewhere, right? And so the subsidy, the quantity times the $2 would be more. What happens to the deficiency payment? It goes down. Look at that. The deficiency payment is the difference between what the cons what the producer got with the target price and the price that the consumer paid. Because of the increase in demand due to learning how to drive cars on corn, then the price, the market price, went up from three dollars up to four or something else. So the deficiency payment shrunk. In fact, if the market changes to being this, what happens to the deficiency payment? Poof. It disappears. Did it take an act of Congress to make it disappear? It's all market driven. Market forces made the policy poof, disappear on its own. Now, because of that policy, though, are the farmers hurt? Because of it disappearing, hey, they're not getting their free money anymore. The subsidy that's kind of sweet to be getting the free money. Are the farmers hurt? No, because they're getting a market price higher than five. So the market has corrected itself on its own such that uh, these parties are all better off and the government gets out of the way. The government got out of the picture with the deficiency payment program. So sometimes these exit strategies are something that's important to be uh, input into the government policy, whatever that is, the, these exit strategies of how does this policy end? And if we tend to look for more market-driven policies that allow flexibility, that tends to be superior to policies that are a little sticky, or that might tend to be sticky, or cause discretionary changes. And as Congress rolls over from year to year to year to year, we've got new people, it's a new vote, it's a big deal, and they have all the pork barreling and all the other crazy pol political stuff, if we can have a policy that works this way, 
That's kind of sweet. So that's the way these two policies are different. It's more in a dynamic sense. Okay, questions or comments there? All right. Well, that wraps up. That wraps up our government intervention chapter. And we need to spend a little time on chapter eight. All right, so chapter eight deals with individuals and their goal to maximize their happiness. So this chapter gave us a little bit of a clue with this consumer surplus business on uh, measuring happiness. And so this is a bit of a challenge. So chapter eight, measuring happiness for the household. It's hard to imagine we could have like a little happiness calculator, but indeed that's what economists claim to be able to do. And hopefully, it's at, as bizarre as it sounds, hopefully I can convince you that this is, this is legit. And so it starts off by having uh, a measure called utility. So total utility, Total utility, TU, or just U, total utility, is the total satisfaction, the total satisfaction derived from consumption of a good or service. The total satisfaction derived from consumption of a good or service. And I want to hit you with the key definitions here. We're doing lots of marginal stuff, so all the action in econ class happens at the margin. And so marginal utility, MU, is the satisfaction derived from an additional an additional unit of consumption marginal utility so the emphasis here, whenever you see that word marginal, you can kind of substitute in your head addition, right? Additional, that extra incremental unit, just like we did in, in some of the, the previous chapters. Okay. Um, so how do, we, how do we measure this? So example, suppose we've got uh, bundle A, I'll explain what a bundle is here in a second. Bundle A and bundle, bundle, bundle B. And we've got, um, we've got, oh, uh, let's go beer and pizza. And M&M's. Beer, pizza, and M&M's. And in bundle A, we've got 10 beers, uh, two pizzas, and uh, five M&M's. And in bundle B, 
We've got eight beers, three pizzas, and four M&Ms. And then I decided we needed bundle C. Bundle C, we've got six beers, one pizza, and uh, three M&Ms. Okay. What I want each and every one of you to do <coughs> is, you can kind of just draw a line here, put your name, you, and I want you on a, on a scale of, of um, one to a hundred, I want you to rank these bundles. And so the way this hundred business works is that a hundred would be like your highest, most preferred bundle. Uh, potentially, but I don't care if you give it a 90 or something. I just want your numbers to be between zero and 100. And I want you to put your numbers in a ranking such that it reveals your preferences for these bundles. So for instance, if you gave this 100 and you like this one half as good, you might give it a 50, right? That's all I want you to do. So you should have three numbers. Look, at, look and think about the various quantities here. You need to have a number here, a number here, and a number here, somewhere between zero to a hundred rating, if you will. You guys have done consumer ratings for whatever. But you can use the zero to a hundred to kind of say how you feel about them. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let's see, um, give me a number between, uh, let's just go uh, three and seven. Five. One, two, three, four, five. All right, go to the board, put the numbers up. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Five. One, two, three. Did I count you guys? Four or five. And one, two, three, four. Wait. My last ten. Never mind. We're done. You, you guys come up. Now we go to the random number generator online and we go one, two, three, four, five. Hunzi. What is your numbers? Uh, four, eight, six. Okay. Four, eight, six. Oh, you guys are putting your numbers in there. Okay, that's fine. So, okay, there we go. Okay, thank you. And then Hunzi is at 486. All right. So, uh, this is a, is this a 40? I didn't see who did this one. 40? So we got a 40 here, this is a 20, no, 80, okay, 80, got it, all right. So 40, 80, all right, so um, first of all, since um, Jordan and uh, who's the blue here? Okay, uh, Melanie, right? All right, so Melanie has 100, Jordan has a 40. Does Melanie like this bundle more than twice as much as Jordan? So you would agree with that because she put 100, he put 40, that if both were given a little welcome basket for econ class with 10 beers, two pizzas, and then you guys know for sure that Melanie likes her bundle two and a half times as much as Jordan likes his bundle. You can say that with certainty. Yeah, let, let's take Hunzi for a second here, who gave it a four. Does Jordan like that bundle ten times as much as Hunzi? Okay. So is it fair to compare these sorts of ratings across people? It's not fair. Right? So th this is something, this is where it's different than a measuring stick. If I have a yardstick 
that is three feet long, we all agree that it's a unit of measure, right? And we can go all measure it independently. We can have our own items and agree, and agree that it's three feet long. And if this thing's two feet long and this one's three feet long, this one's a foot longer than this one, right? That's not true here. So you might be saying, oh, these numbers are kind of BS then. Why are we even doing this? Well, is it fair to say that Jordan, he's got a 40 here and an 80 here. Is it fair to say Jordan likes bundle B twice as much as he likes bundle A? Yes. yes, right? So in other words, it's possible for all of us to individually use numbers to rank our preferences, but it's not fair to then take those interpersonally and compare them across individuals. But it is possible to come up with what we call an ordinal ranking to our preferences using numbers. And that's part of what this utility business builds on is that's, that's our numbering system. It, it's more internal to the individual and how they rank them. All right, so questions or comments so far on that? All right, so let's put, uh, let's put those notes down so you have them in your notes here. So note, um, can't, can't use numbers across individuals. But we can use numbers for ranking individual preferences. They all of a sudden have meaning individual preferences. So from our example, Jordan likes Jordan likes B twice as much. Jordan likes B twice as much as A, as bundle A. Jordan likes B twice as much as A. It actually turns out the same thing for hunting, interestingly enough, four and eight. So the actual relative magnitudes of the numbers didn't matter, but we're able to use them to show preferences. Which one does Hunzi like the most? B, right? And so we, he revealed part of his preferences by using these numbers, even though the numbers don't correlate across individuals. Uh, same thing with Melanie liked A better. Now, what might we be able to deduce between Jordan and uh, Melanie based on these numbers? If we dig a little deeper, we do kind of have, we have the, the rankings a little bit different. So Jordan likes B, then A, then C. So Jordan is a, a BAC guy, and Melanie is an ABC guy. Right? Does that tell us anything? Okay, they, what, what are you saying? They don't like what? They don't like C. C, yeah, th that's a commonality, right? Now, what was true about C? There's less of everything. So that brings us to another uh, thing, assumption that we have in microeconomics for this type of analysis. More is preferred to less. More is preferred to less. And let's see, did everybody come out that way? No. Uh, Hansi, we have a little problem here. What's the deal here? <laughs> so usually this comes down to, did you understand the full problem? Although you could be an outlier in the economics world somewhere. Do you prefer more things than less or? Why don't you unmute? Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think I. Um, the uh, I refer to the C is uh, higher than the A because uh, I mean that's a personal reference, right? Yes. So C, you had but, um, C higher than A. But we're wondering right. why, because C has less fear 
C has less pizza, and C has less M&Ms. Are you an outlier in economics? <laughs> you might be, otherwise, you know, I'm throwing a lot at you guys. Some of you might have, you know, I'm not gonna ask people to raise their hands, but maybe there's a couple other hundreds here. That's usually not unusual when I, when I do this. So, but that kind of goes against this, one of these principles with this uh, behavioral stuff and purchases. More is preferred to less. All right, but for most people, we got that going on. Right? So that was one thing. Um, what else? Uh, what else might we deduce between? So we got the C thing. Can we tell anything here about Jordan and and uh, Melanie? Okay, one's more willing. So what? What's the? What's yeah? What's going on here? So B to A was Jordan. We got less of this. We got less of this. So what does that say about Jordan here? He likes pizza. In fact, he likes it a lot, right? He's willing to trade off. He's willing to trade off uh, uh, the beer and the M&M. So he might dislike these things. We don't know for sure. But we're just observing the data. And we see that he's got a pretty high value on pizza, apparently, because he's willing to dump both of these goods to get the extra pizza. Now, Melanie, on the other hand, what does this say about Melanie? All right, we might have found our beer drinker, apparently. Or a real Eminem lover. Oh, she's shaking her head. Trust me, don't tell my mom. Is this being recorded? This is, I mean, this will not go out. As long as you guys don't share this with your parents, it won't matter. But as an economist, I can see that she was willing to trade off a pizza to get more beer and more M&Ms, which makes her potentially an M&M lover and a beer might not even matter, right? She could put, I'm, I'm saving you now, Melanie. She could put absolutely zero value on beer and still have this outcome. You follow what I mean? So the M&Ms could have been driving the whole ship. See how I have to save the day? All right, so the M&Ms were driving the whole ship apparently. Okay, so that's how we use these numbers to get some insights on consumers' purchases and, and behavior. And all of this ultimately ties back to uh, the demand curve and, and supply curve. All right, so now what I want to do is pick apart some of the individual uh, items. Let me save that for now. I don't know if I'll come back to it. So if we pick off the, uh, if we pick off the, uh, M&Ms for now, or maybe I should just jump into this example. Now let's let's do this graph first. If I look at M&Ms, and now I'm going to be measuring utility over here. So remember, one of the important things in econ class when you guys get graphs on your homework or stuff, look at the axis first before you look at the action in the middle. I know that our eye always tends to go to the action in the middle, but it's actually more important to look at the axes first. So we've got utility being measured here, M&Ms being measured here. We've got one bag of M&Ms, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? I'm going away from this problem here. One, two, three, four, five, although we could kind of tie it into this problem here since we had uh, different levels. So if I was to graph, in general, don't put this on your papers right now, but if I was to graph the, uh, the total utility function, would it in general be like this, 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 or this? So A, B, C, D, is that it? One, two, three, four, is that label off? A, B, C, or D? The total utility, B, right? As I consume more M&Ms, total utility is going up. More M&Ms, more is preferred to less, meaning happiness is going up. So those two things are positively related. Take away my M&Ms, you take away my happiness, my satisfaction. So those two things are moving in the same direction. So B is our answer. Now, again, don't write this yet, but does it look like this, this, or this? A, B, or C, those are all positively related functions showing uh, more M&Ms giving more utility. 
Which one do you think it is, A, B, or C? C. Why? Tummy ache, yeah. Let me go over here, yeah? Once you get too much to a certain number, your happiness isn't going to increase. It's not going to, I like the way you carefully worded that because most students screw that up. It says that they'll say something like, your happiness will eventually go down. It's not going down. It's kind of flatlining, right? It's increasing at a decreasing rate. So your utility is still going up, but not by as much. So C is the correct answer. And so our total utility <coughs> function looks like this. And it displays the law of diminishing marginal utility. The law of diminishing marginal utility. Now I brought that marginal thing in, which means additional, which also means our, our uh, suffix goggles might be on here. If I'm looking at this thing with marginal analysis, what happens in the number line? It magically gets this If I'm trying to do marginal analysis here, what happens to the one here with our goggles? It magically gets a and a erd, right? It magically starts to get a st and a and a whoops, a third is a turd, erd and a right? So it magically starts to get those things. Those aren't in your textbook. That's not going to be on your homework, but you guys need to have those goggles when we start thinking about marginal. So the marginal utility that I got from the first M and M was the area of this rectangle. Some of you might have said, oh, I get, uh, I don't know, let's go with 100 units of satisfaction if I just arbitrarily, suppose one M and M gives you 100. What is the marginal utility of the second M&M? &M? It's bigger. Total utility goes up. My total satisfaction goes up to, let's say, 150. Now, we can really have this scaled to make it appropriate, but it goes up to 150. So what was the marginal utility of the second M&M? &M? 50, right? And there's the law of diminishing marginal utility kicking in. The third raises my utility to this amount, but it only added this amount. The fourth raises it to here, but only added this amount. So these incremental amounts are changing. So if this went up to, I don't know, I'm just making up numbers, 165, and then this one finally went up to 170, we get the diminishing utility of each additional m and we start to get sick and tired of M&Ms. They don't get us as happy as they were before. So yes? On a larger scale, it would go back to um, So will it go back down? So with the, with the more is preferred to less criteria, it would not go down. Because we'd always give the option for you to not actually eat them. Now, if you were forced by a dictator to eat the M&Ms, if that's all you had, and they made you gorge yourself, and you started feeling sick, and you're going to puke or whatever, and maybe this is the uncertainty part. Somebody said a tummy ache that you don't, there's uncertainty, so you don't know that they're going to make you sick at some point in time. Then it's possible for that to go down. So, but in general, we just uh, we kind of ignore that. But in reality, yeah, there's circumstances that could be possible. All right, so any questions on this graph? All of this red boxes are marginal utilities. That's the connection between total utility and marginal utility. <clears throat> okay, so time to get some schedule goggles on with this. <coughs> um, Thank you.
Okay, so um, I'm going to give you a bunch of numbers, so you're going to have to I'll just kind of walk through them after we're done. So we've got quantity of beer. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Quantity or uh, total utility from beer. And then we're going to do marginal utility from beer. So schedule goggles, you might see a homework problem like this. No beer, no happiness. That's easy one. One beer, 40 units of happiness. Two beers, 60. Three, 70. Four, 75. And five, 73. We're back down to puking here. That, that, we're getting back to Ike. I wanted to play up Ike's thing here. Yes. So marginal utility, when you have your schedule goggles on, what did the first fear give us? 40. Second, 20. Right. And now we're kind of doing what we did at Tangles there. 60 to 70, the third gave us 10. Five and then finally negative two. First one's kind of undefined. It's actually not even really zero, it just doesn't even exist. It'd be the marginal utility from the zero here or something. We can't have a negative one here. Alright, then we've got uh, quantity of pizza. We got slices of pizza. Again, let's go zero to five. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. And total utility from pizza, the pizza, uh, zero pizza gives us zero utility. One pizza, 20, two, 34, three, 44, uh, four, 50, and five, 54. Marginal utility from pizza, Undefined for the first unit, or for the zero unit. The first unit of pizza gives me 20 units of happiness. The second, 14. Right? Going from 20 to 34, I got 40 unit, 14 units, then 10, then 6, then 4. So with our schedule goggles on, the law of diminishing marginal utility shows up this way that the amount of happiness that we get from each additional unit starts to fall. All right. So, um, what if we have 10 bucks to spend? If we have an income of 10 bucks and the price of beer is a dollar and the price of pizza is $2, How much should we do? That's kind of an interesting question. Before we jump too deep into that, I want to introduce you to the budget line. <laughs> which is also called the budget constraint, which is just what I gave you. All of a sudden I said, oh, you didn't tell me we were only going to have 10 bucks, right? So maximizing your happiness, as you guys well know, know so good, know, know so well, is tougher when you have a budget constraint. You only got 10 bucks to spend. This is your little happiness meter. So I know that I've got an income of ten dollars that I can spend. I can't spend more. And this isn't the government, so I can't spend more than I actually have. So I've got a binding budget constraint of ten dollars. So I'm going to take the price of beer times the quantity of beer plus the price of pizza times the quantity of pizza. This is my spending on goods and services. Income must equal spending. So using the numbers that we got, and this is income, by the way, our income equals $10. Uh, 
our $10 equals the price of beer I gave you, which is $1, times the quantity, that's what I'm trying to choose to make myself happy, but I don't know how much I want, plus a $2 pizza times the quantity of pizza. Three pizzas, four beers. Ooh, I like that answer. All right, <coughs> let me come back to you here. All right, so if I was to graph, if I was to graph this thing out, and I have beer on the vertical axis, quantity of beer, remember it's always important to look at the axes, and quantity of pizza on the horizontal axis. If I blew my whole 10 bucks on beer, well, how much could I have? 10. So one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You don't have to do this perfectly, but let me just put that point. That is a possible consumption point for me. I can afford point A. I can afford point A. If I blew my wad on pizza, how many could I have? Five pizzas. One, two, three, four, five. That's another possible consumption point. And then I've got all these combinations in between, right? Pizza costs $2, which means if I give up one pizza, I could get two beers. So we kind of got a rise of a run thing going where we could be anywhere along this budget line. That is called the budget line. All right, so we know now that this represents all affordable, all affordable bundles of beer and pizza. I can be anywhere in this kind of this whole region here. I can be at uh, minus two and four. I can be down two over one. I can be anywhere along there. So back to this graph. I'm running a little on time, so I want to walk you through. We still got a few minutes. Don't get too great. Am I gonna buy my, spend my first bit of money on pizza or beer? Beer, right? So because a beer brings me 40 units of happiness, and my first pizza only brings me 20, right? So now, am I going to spend my next chunk of money on thy second beer or my first pizza? Second beer. Second beer, either or, we're indifferent. So this is a hidden rule of economics, mostly derived by Russ McCullough, that you always go with beer, actually, when it's pushed like that. So, so this is the beer. Right? Now, technically, you could go with the pizza. I just want, this is the, the Russ economics now. Now, do I want to go with the third beer or the first pizza? Either. Ah, either. Both. Both? Now I got a 10 versus a 20. But what's the deal? We go with pizza, right? But one thing we're not taking into account, and that's the price. The pizza cost me two bucks. So I would be 20 divided by two for the same amount of beer. There's one thing that we'll, we'll need to take into account. I'm going to hold you a little long today. I'm just going to tell you. Just give me a couple minutes. i got to get through this. Almost done. I remember I gave you all those minutes before. So, um, All right, so let me shut up and keep going here. So how much have we spent if we grab our first pizza? How much have we spent now? We've got $2 here, $2 here. Before, we still got $6 to go. And so if we keep going through, where do we end up? Yeah. Now, what we've really done, though, is we found the spot where our marginal dollar gave us the most bang for our buck. And so the last thing that I want you to have in your notes so that you got it for the homework and test, which is due, is just this. Marginal utility per dollar of pizza divided by the price of pizza 
has to be equal to the marginal utility of beer divided by the price of beer. And that's exactly what we just did with thinking about the dollars. This is really bang for our buck, right? So when we spend money, we're always looking for the greatest bang for our buck. Bang for our buck. And that is marginal utility per dollar. Because you guys picked up on it perfectly here that the pizza gives me 20 units of satisfaction, but it cost me two bucks. So it's really 10 units of satisfaction per dollar to make it fair with each good. All right. So we end up with four and three, and I think that's where we're going to end up for today. That looks good. There is a little bit more, you guys, uh, in the, um, I didn't get as much on the board as I normally do, but it's, it's in your book, that's why. and we hit all the topics that we need to do. I can give you a swipe. Did everybody get on the uh, attendance sheet? It was certain, hopefully made it around. Okay, yeah.